Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Today in True Crime and Portraits podcast. I'm your host, Jane Flowers. Today's episode 11 is part 2 of Perfectly Boring Article by Oxford American Magazine, Slanders and Fabricates U.S. Navy Veteran Dentist Dr. Tom Boring's Life and Unsolved Murder. This episode is about true crime and portrait photography. Today, I will be talking about my father's life and unsolved murder that has been slandered and fabricated throughout an article called Perfectly Boring that was published by Oxford American Magazine in the spring of 2018 in the magazine's 100th issue on March 13th. 2018. William Stephenson wrote this article. In this episode, I also speak about photographer William Eggleston and his false claims made in this article about my father's life and unsolved murder for money. Now, I would like to go over the rest of this perfectly boring article with you. The article went on to say, I saw pictures of his before I ever met him. Chubb told me of Eggleston when we finally reconnected. This was before the MoMA show, before he was a known quantity in the city. Chubb had seen the pictures at the Upper East Side apartment of writer Noel Parmeltel's girlfriend, where Eggleston had, for some reason, left around 800 photographs in an aluminum suitcase stash in the closet. A group of friends sat on the floor and held an impromptu exhibition. It changed the way I look at the world, Chubb remembered. Photographs can look like this. He and Eggleston became close and made frequent trips together in the Delta. This was during the period of Boring's dissipation. Chubb recalled once in Greenwood seeing Boring encounter his childhood nursemaid, who was broken at his drunken state, that she took off her shoe and hit him over the head with it repeatedly. Knocked him flat, he said. Well, that's pretty interesting right there. Let me stop for a second and point out that, again, this is possible hearsay, as most of the article is full of false claims about Tom to begin with. I wouldn't know if this was true or not, but I've never heard anything about Tom's nursemaid knocking him flat out with her shoe or if he even had a nursemaid to begin with. It would not be of a surprise to me if this is just another made-up false claim. The article went on to state, One year, Chubb invited the two men to have Thanksgiving dinner in New Jersey, where what he calls his old-fashioned wasp family lived on a farm. I thought it would be amusing, and it was, he said. They arrived stoned on quaaludes or percocets. He can't recall which, and didn't touch the food. Let's stop here for a minute, and I want to point out, how in the hell can William Stephenson say my father was on percocets and quaaludes, but then you can't remember which one it was that he was taking with Eggleston and Cotty Chubb? That's a little screwy right there, let me tell you. The article went on to state, Chubb's parents tried gamingly to engage them in conversation. His mother told Eggleston about the deer that had become pests, eating the yellow bushes in their front lawn. Eggleston, trying to be helpful, said, Why don't you just take a forty-five and shoot them in the head? She demurmured politely, boring, meanwhile, charmed them with ease. As they were leaving, Chubb's mother said, 
It's been lovely to meet you, Mr. Boring. Will you be staying in New York long? Oh, no, ma'am. I'm sorry, he replied. I have to go to Mississippi to go to prison. In 1980, Eggleston and Chubb flew to Africa. Among other things, the trip imprinted on the photographer images of fire and great primordial chaos. When I got back from Kenya, it dawned on me that everything I was seeing was the result of violent volcanic activity aeons ago, he remembered later. I tried to imagine what it was like when those fireballs were coming hundreds of miles. It must have been a hell of an event. One Friday night that May, as recounted on the front page of the next morning's Greenwood Commonwealth, two teenagers were driving down Greenwood's West Park Avenue when they noticed a fireball in the sky above the small Mississippi town. They turned the corner down Virginia Street and found T.C. Boring's house engulfed in flames. The fire department arrived and pumped 10,000 gallons of water onto the building, which nevertheless was reduced to an ashen ruin. Boring's body was found on the floor by his bedroom. His head was on a pillow. Greenwood's new chief of police, James Stevens, told the paper that the damage was bad enough to cause death but took care to note that his mustache was not burned off. Boring's death didn't exactly send shockwaves through the town. Morbidly, it had long been viewed as foregone conclusion. Everybody knew Tom was going to come to some sort of a bad end. Wood told me, he wasn't going to live to be 90 and die with a family all around him, with a priest giving him the last rites. The Greenwood police, too, didn't ever exert themselves in the aftermath of the fire. The police didn't do any damn thing to try to find out what happened. It was more like good riddance, Clay said. I wouldn't say it was a sanctioned death, but... I don't think anybody really cared. I want to stop here and get my opinion out to you all about what I just read to you. I care about my father's unsolved murder. My dad's sister cares about his murder. There are many people that care about my father's unsolved murder. It's pretty cold on Clay's part to say that she thinks that nobody really cared about my father being murdered. It's just another way for her and William Eggleston to defame my father. The article went on to say, The city's indifference to Boring's death should have been complicated by the fact that the fire didn't appear to have been an accident, but this didn't inspire much concern. That investigation when Tom died, Wood said, was about the shortest one in the history of Greenwood Police Department. There were many theories. He was murdered by racists, disgusted by his affection for the black community. He was attacked by a father as revenge for the corruption of his daughter. Maybe a drug deal had gone by. There were even whispers that a former girlfriend's father was a principal in the Louisiana Mafia. That standard police inquiry, did the victim have any enemies, was rendered comical in this context. As Wood put it, there were any number of people who said they were going to kill him. I'm going to stop here for a second and speak my mind about what I just read. I want someone held accountable for the murder of my father, U.S. Navy veteran dentist, Dr. Tom Boring. I and my family need comfort 
and knowing who murdered my father. I and my family have been grieving for decades over his untimely death, and without closure, our pain and suffering only continues. It pains me when I read this article and have to put this podcast together. If you think it doesn't, well then you're wrong, because it's not easy putting together these podcasts for you all to listen to. I'm constantly reminded every time I put the podcasts together about my father's murder. Meanwhile, I and my family have become a different kind of victim while we wait patiently for the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation to investigate Tom's unsolved cold case murder that just sits in limbo. There's nothing comical about my father's unsolved murder as perfectly boring just stated. If the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation could investigate his unsolved murder properly, then maybe his family would get justice in knowing that the murderer might be caught soon. But does this matter to William Eggleston and the others that speak all these lies about my father's life and unsolved murder? I would think not. Getting back to the article, it went on to say, I sent off for Boring's death certificate. Smoke inhalation was listed as one cause of death, but under other significant conditions, it cited right temporal skull fractures and multiple cerebral contusions. There was suspicious skull trauma that was pending investigation. On the back of the certificate, the coroner had recorded his personal impressions. Since the deceased had sustained head trauma before the fire, I think the fire was probably intentionally set to try and cancel or disguise a homicide. I'm going to stop here for a minute and talk about what I just read. It's illegal to order someone's birth certificate from the state of Mississippi unless you are their next of kin. This is a fact. So whatever William Stephenson is saying about how he ordered my father's death certificate from the Mississippi State Department of Health, well, this is not legally possible. I called the Mississippi State Department of Health and spoke to them about this, and they even told me verbally over the phone that they are not allowed to give out anyone's death certificate unless it's to their next of kin. So William Stephenson is obviously lying, and I'd like to say that I suspect my father's home was robbed after he was murdered. I think that the person that murdered him had intentions to go in my father's home and rob him of his property before murdering him. I also think that they set the house on fire to make sure no one knew of any items that were stolen from him after his murder. This, in my opinion, is why the person murdered him. I think it was for someone else's gain, meaning the person was robbing him and that's what took place after they murdered him, or they killed him because he was just in their way. I also think that it was not just one person that murdered him, but a group of people that came into his home and orchestrated his malicious beating and then afterwards set his house on fire that caused him to die from smoke inhalation. I'm going to go back to the article now. It went on to say, One day last summer I spoke to a woman who had once been close to boring She hadn't thought much about him lately and seemed to find the reminiscing more painful than pleasant. But at the end of our conversation, she shared a story she thought might interest me. 
Two men had been arrested for another murder in Greenwood two years after Borings. They were convicted and are still in prison today. But when the Greenwood police spoke to the sister of the victim, they supposedly told her they had reason to believe these men had also been responsible for Boring's killing. When I contacted the sister, she responded graciously, but firmly. She didn't want to discuss it. Bad memories from a long time ago, she wrote in an email, leaving it at that. I called the Greenwood Police Department and asked for the copy of their records on Boring's death. After some initial confusion, I was transferred to the oldest person on staff, Captain Andrews, who had some vague memories of the event. Just about anybody that worked that case is retired and gone, he told me. I asked about the manner of death. I'd heard a rumor he had been killed with an axe. As far as I know, I think he was bludgeoned and I think the house was set on fire. No suspect was ever developed. I asked if they could send me the case file. He considered it for a moment, then said, those records were destroyed in, I think, a fire. I want to stop here and point out some stuff to you all. Who the hell does William Stephenson think he is? Why is he not contacting me about my father's unsolved murder? He reached out to everyone else except my father's direct relatives. I will say this much. Don't worry, William Stephenson. I'll make sure that you're subpoenaed to come to court when my father's unsolved murder case is tried for your slanderous, defamating comments made throughout this whole perfectly boring article. You might not want to talk to me now or to have talked to me in the past about all your lies that you and William Eggleston have been spreading about my father's life and unsolved murder for money with this perfectly boring article. But don't worry, when it's all said and done, I will see you and William in court one day for the defamating, fabricating comments that were made about Tom on this entire perfectly boring article by Oxford American Magazine. The article went on to say, The more empty the photograph, Luke Santis writes in evidence, the more it will imply horror. Eggleston's image of the red ceiling is a case in point. It has become one of his most emblematic works. In 1974, it was on the cover both of his first portfolio of dye transfer prints, 14 pictures, and of the album Radio City by Big Star, which is where I first saw it decades later. It was just accepted as a masterpiece, Chubb told me, a signature picture an icon, but whatever else the photo represents, it is also an image of a certain kind of horror, a crime scene photograph of a crime that hasn't happened yet. Whether or not the subject is already dead, as Roland Barthes put it, every photograph is this catastrophe. The emptiness of the photograph is acute and deafening. There still remained at least one person I hadn't spoken to about the red ceiling. The photographer. At 78, William Eggleston lives in one of the South's most elegant residential hotels, a century-old building overlooking Memphis Overton Park. There's a lure to meeting him. One I considered as I rode the elevator up to his floor. In the 80s, he once greeted a Newsweek writer at the door with a revolver in one hand. When a reporter from Vanity Fair came to profile him years later, 
Eggleston made him take special precautions as there are two bench warrants out for my arrest. But Eggleston also has a reputation for being soft-spoken, almost unnervingly so, and this was how I found him, unarmed and in a warm mood. He was reclining on the couch in his suite, dressed in a cleanly pressed white shirt, chain-smoking and drinking his daily ration of whiskey. His wife Rosa had passed away recently, and he's lived alone ever since. He's had to be physically careful. He'd broken his neck in a fall a few years before, and the doctors told him he couldn't afford another accident like that. A sign on the apartment door warned visitors against trying to provoke him into old habits. If you bring additional alcohol into this apartment, you are placing him in mortal danger. After a few moments of small talk, I brought up T.C. Boring, and he seemed bemused to hear the name. I showed him the new portrait from the guide. I'm going to stop here for a minute and tell you about what nude photograph he's talking about. The nude photograph he's talking about is called Untitled T.C. Boring, 1972, Greenwood, Mississippi, by photographer William Eggleston. This photo can be seen in William Eggleston's fine art photography book called William Eggleston's Guide. I also spoke about this photograph and eight other fine art photographs taken of my father and his home by Eggleston in great detail in my father's biography called The True Legacy of Dr. Tom Boring. This is not the only nude photograph of my father that William took of him in the early 70s. The logo I use for my podcast is also another nude portrait photograph that William Eggleston has put in circulation on social media with the help of his son Winston Eggleston. The article went on to state and his eyes lit up with something like nostalgia or an admiration. What did the photograph make him think of? I just think about what great friends we were, he said. He was a perfect gentleman, well-dressed, impeccable manners, a southern gentleman. I pointed out that in most of the photos I'd seen, he wasn't dressed at all. It was short of this way, he said slowly, at will, like a chameleon. T.C. could become a different thing. He was an alien. He paused before adding, to them, he was an alien, not to me. I would like to put my two cents and right here and say that my father was never an alien. That's just another defamating claim that William Eggleston has to throw out there in the article. I'm assuming he was drunk when he said that. Makes you wonder if he was drunk most of the time when he would make his defamating slanderous remarks about my father's life and unsolved murder. You definitely see William Eggleston intoxicated in most of his films and interviews he's been in. One would think that a lot of his stories he's made up about my father's life have, I suspect, been made up while he was intoxicated in one way or another. Very sad on his part. The article went on to state... He said he wasn't sure he could help me. The murder is an unresolved mystery, he said. No one knows who did it, why they did it. I found out about it a couple of weeks later. I spoke with different people that both of us knew, and nobody seemed to know a damn thing about it. Not one damn thing. He shook his head and lit another cigarette. 
My deceased friend T.C. Boren, he repeated. I don't know what I could tell you. I want to stop here for a moment and say, well, I know what you can tell me, William Algelson. You can tell me what you know about this axe that you said murdered my father. While you're at it, you can tell me why you know there was an axe that murdered him when there was no murder weapon ever recovered from the burnt-out remains of his home. What do you know about my father's murder, William Eggleston, that you refuse to speak to me about? Do you plan on continuing making millions of dollars off my father's life and unsolved murder with your false claims? I wonder this sometimes while I suffer in pain knowing my father's life and unsolved murder is fabricated for millions of dollars for someone else's benefit and gain. The article went on to state, In his presence, Eggleston's digressions don't seem like digressions. They seem like natural extensions of a submerged conversation you should have been having all along, but which only he recognized as such. This was my sense, at least, when he appeared to change the subject. In the realm of art, very little is possible, or truly probable, he said. I'm quoting what I know about quantum electrodynamics. This is something worth remembering from me to you. The end result of the endeavor is not something singularly accurate. On the other hand, it's something probable. He clinked the ice in his glass unhappily noting it was nearly empty. It occurred to me that perhaps he hadn't changed the subject at all. I'm talking nonsense, of course, he laughed. Then again, it really isn't. You must have picked up I'm quite into advanced studies of physics. From there, the night veered comfortably off course. Eggleston spent a half hour playing Robert Burns' pieces on his seven-foot Bossendorf grand piano. He insisted we watch the entirety of the David Byrne film, The True Stories, which he hadn't thought about since he visited the set in 1986. Periodically, in the middle of some speech or another, he waved his cigarette in the direction of a framed portrait of Bach, whom he referred to as the master. Most of all, he spoke adoringly about the other close friends he lost over the years, Diane Arbus, Gary Winogrand, Eudora Welty, the last of whom had written a moving appreciation of his work and her introduction to the original edition of the Democratic Forest. I think of it often when I look at his picture, her idea that they succeed in showing us the grain of the present, like the cross, section of a tree. As the night wore on, Eggleston grew less and less coherent, as his family had prepared me to expect. He grew more despondent, too. At one point, he changed the subject again, or not, to relate something he learned that morning from the housekeeper. A man, last night, committed suicide here, he said, lying back down on the couch. He'd been abandoned by his family, and he was a big drinker, too. So he downed a whole bottle of sleeping pills and chased them with strychnine. A very nice man, about sixty years old. Nobody gave a shit about him. He tried standing, then gave up and laid back down. Things in life are not always so pleasant. As with remembering why I'd come, our conversation looked back to the red ceiling. I'd worried he might have forgotten the details, given that it was one shot out of thousands over the course of his lifetime, 
but he was to look at it again and lit another cigarette. I handed him a copy of a book I'd brought. He grinned strangely. Brenda and T.C. and I were the three people who were lying in the bed when I took the picture, he said. So he did remember that day. Of course, he said. Yes, we were just having a nice time talking about this and that, talk about nonsense, the three of us lying there in bed. It was a big bed. And I remember one split second. I looked up. I thought, that's a great picture. And then I took the picture. After that, I don't know what happened. He closed the book and gave it back to me. I don't think anything much happened. This concludes the end of the Perfectly Boring article. Now I would like to share with you all what I wrote in my father's biography about what L. William Eggleston was doing during the time he took the photograph, The Red Ceiling, per the accounts of my mother. My mother told me what happened in that room and as well I wrote about it in my father's biography. This is what I said in my father's biography, The True Legacy of Dr. Tom Boring, on page 104 to 106 about what happened in that room. When Tom and William were hanging out together in the Delta, they would spend most of their time drinking beer or whiskey, and sometimes they were using drugs together, such as quaaludes, while they were spending their time together drinking alcohol and getting high. William was often photographing Tom and his home. There are a total of nine photographs that I am aware of that William took of Tom and his home. There are, I suspect, many more photos of Tom and his home that were taken by his friend William, but he has never spoken to me if this is true or not. William refused to speak to me about my father. Meanwhile, over the many years, these photographs have come to be considered works of art that are very famous and well-known all over the world. The most famous by far out of the nine photographs of fine art photography in this book taken by William Eggleston in Tom's home at 508 MacArthur Street is called Untitled Greenwood, Mississippi, 1973, and formerly known as The Red Ceiling. William has stated that this photograph, The Red Ceiling, is so powerful that, in fact, I've never seen it reproduced on any page to my satisfaction. When you look at a dye transfer print, it's like it's red blood that is wet on the wall. The photograph was like a Bach exercise for me because I knew red was the most difficult color to work with. A little red is usually enough, but to work with an entire surface was a challenge. It was hard to do. I don't know of any total red pictures, except in advertising. The photograph is still powerful. It shocks you every time. Quote by William Eggleston. If you'd like to know the rest of what I said in my father's biography about the red ceiling photograph, and what was occurring during the time when the photo was taken by William Eggleston, then please head over to episode 4 and listen to my podcast called Untitled Greenwood, Mississippi, 1973, informally known as The Red Ceiling, an overview. My podcast will explain to you about the origins of the ionic photograph while I speak about the photograph in full detail. I want to say that I noticed, with this article, Perfectly Boring, how my father's life in unsolved murder has attracted a cult-like following. You see that as well with David Lynch's films that his work has somewhat of a cult-like following 
And would it surprise you that William Eggleston's work also has a cult-like following with photos taken of my father and his home? Despite the fact that William and David are good friends, it would not surprise me in the least bit. My father's unsolved murder and his life has attracted a very large cult following. One of the people that followed my father's life in unsolved murder actually gave me their opinion about what they thought about this article, and I would like to share with you all what they stated. My father is a murdered man, and he is not being treated as how a murdered man should be treated. There's no excuse for the false claims William Eggleston has made about my father's life in unsolved murder. Now, I want to read to you all the statement that was made on Metafilter by a woman that goes by the name of Countess Elena in regard to this article, Perfectly Boring. I commented to Countess Elena about her comment directed towards my father's unsolved murder. This is what she said on May 19, 2018. Countess Elena stated, I grew up in a town near Greenwood. My dad and uncle, who is now an established artist, were are the outskirts of this life. They were young at the time, and although they didn't know these people, they knew folks who did. They were some dark stories about this kind of southern hippie life. When I was a kid, my folks had laundry room painted that exact same shade of red. I loved it, but it was so inexplicable and so different from the rest of the house that I wondered if it wasn't to do with this photograph. I love it, and in fact, I once sent it to someone on a postcard without realizing there was a naughty poster in the corner. All of this article was using language suggesting the abuse of a woman as an aside, which is often the case in great artist write-ups. Eggleston is pretty fierce reflection of our local aesthetic and his art and apparently in his circle. This, for example, is an extremely Delta story. Chubb recalled once in Greenwood seeing Boring encounter his childhood nursemaid who was so heartbroken at his drunken state that she took off her shoe and hit him over the head with it repeatedly. I would bet money that the nursemaid was black, and that shoe beating was unexpected and approved liberty because of the quasi-familiar relationships that ultimately shore up the Delta's brand of white supremacy. It also doesn't surprise me to hear about the police just not looking into a murder because reasons. Thanks for this article. I love that place, and I want to set it on fire and live there forever, which is hard to sort out, so I plan to do neither. Posted by Countess Elena at 1.25 p.m. on May 19, 2018. This was my comment response to Countess Elena's review of Perfectly Boring. Well, my dad was Dr. T.C. Boring, I am his daughter, Brenda Jane Boring, and I read Perfectly Boring and was not impressed with the accuracy of how my father's life was portrayed and his demise, murder, and may I please say how appalled I am to read how Countess Elena wrote, I love that place and want to see it on fire. What kind of poetry is this? You're right, you want to see my father's home on fire? My childhood home on fire? This is quite sickening. What is wrong with the people in the world today? Is a person's murder never respected in the fact that you don't make up stuff? What, like, 
Countess Elena concocted in her head about the burning down of my home, and she wants to see it burn? This is sickening, and then you all think it's just so cool to bring up a man's murder and make up all kinds of assumptions and statements about someone you have never met and will never meet? I'm not happy or impressed with this article put out about my dad that was mentioned in the article Perfectly Boring. Get a life, people, and leave a man's murder alone if you have any respect for the dearly departed, which you probably have none. Posted by Jane Pashon at 929 on May 22, 2018. As you can see in my comment, I was not impressed with Countess Elena's review of Perfectly Boring. Countess Elena was kind enough, though, to apologize to me about her comment made towards my father's unsolved murder. It's not often that people apologize to me about comments they make about my father's unsolved murder. Most of the time, people make ugly, rude comments and are in disregard if they care if my claims about my father's life and unsolved murder are true or not. I'm a victim just as much as my father's a victim. My family and I will never have peace until we have closure with his unsolved murder. This is what I said to Countess Elena after her apology. I accept your apology, Countess Elena. I will not change my mind about your poetry associated with my father's murder. I'm not happy and I will never accept what you wrote about my dad's house burning and how you want to see it burn. But I guess some people don't realize at the, at the time what their words could do and how it can affect the person. I'm going to be just fine. I'm writing a book about my father's life and murder. I'm done with all the fake false articles about my dad's life and murder. Imperfectly boring, the author William Stephenson claims my dad was married three times. Imperfectly boring. But he doesn't name my dad's third so-called wife, which is total BS. My dad was married twice. I want to stop here and explain why I stated this. It was because at the time in early 2016, I was unknowing that my father was ever married three times when I stated this on Metafilter. Not until I spoke to his third wife later on did I know that he was married for a third time. I'm going to critique articles made up about my dad because I'm sick of all the false information put out in the media that is related to my father. You never hear any of the articles speaking about my father serving in the Korean War in a positive manner. If you all want to know who I think and know who murdered my dad, then you are just going to have to read my book. The True Legacy of Dr. Tom Boring to find out. Because I was told who murdered him. I'm the only one that knows who took out my dad. I'm done here. Posted by Jane Pashon at 8.39 a.m. on May 23, 2018. I want to stop here for a second and say I thought I knew who murdered him because I thought William Eggleston had something to do with that. He's the one that had so much to gain from my father's murder with him being dead. You see this in his portrait exhibitions, films, and with, with all the false claims he's made about my father's life and unsolved murder for money with nude photos of my father's body and his home. That's very evident right there, isn't it? My mother would later tell me that she suspected she knew who murdered him so that made me think that I knew who murdered him per the accounts of my mother's claim of who she thought murdered him. Countess Elena's response to me was, Thank you for posting here. I'm very sorry that what I said caused you pain. I was unhappy that no one in Greenwood seemed to have sought justice in his matter. I did not intend to sound threatening to anyone or any place. On the contrary, 
What I said was an expression of powerlessness produced by deep and contrasting emotions about the Mississippi Delta. Like a lot of people from Mississippi, I have very complex and passionate feelings about it due to the sharp dissonance between its warmth and beauty and its deep-rooted cultural problems. I used poetic license and hyperbole to express emotions that I feel precisely because I do not think that suffering has been respected enough there. I want you to know that I heard you, and I'm sure that I have made you unhappy. Posted by Countess Elena at 10.15 a.m. on May 22, 2018. I forgive Countess Elena for her comments about my father's unsolved murder, but I'll never forget. I also never forgot what my mother told me about how she knew for a fact possibly how my father was murdered. Despite the fact my mother told me she suspected she knew who murdered him, I'll never know for sure if he was murdered by the Italian Mafia from New Orleans. She didn't tell me who authorized the hit if it was indeed a hit that murdered him. My mother told me that the night before he was murdered that there were a couple of expensive black sedan Cadillacs out in front of his house. Then later that morning he died around 2 a.m. from smoke inhalation. She said she suspected the Italian mob from New Orleans killed him. She also stated that the day before he was murdered, he called her on the phone and he said he was across the street from her house. And while she was on the phone talking to him, he stated to her, I've got a shotgun aimed at the window right now at you and I'm going to blow your head off. Supposedly, my mother stated to me that my father threatened her life. If I can remember correctly, she also stated he was possibly drunk at the time when he had supposedly threatened her life. Then the next day, she stated there were black shiny Cadillac sedans at his house. I'm not quite sure why my father was threatening my mother's life while on the phone with her in 1980 in Greenwood, Mississippi, but the very next day he was murdered, which is kind of odd in itself. My mother and father's relationship was volatile at times, so it was not unusual for him to threaten her life or for him to freak out. I don't think him threatening her life had anything to do with his murder. My mother also never mentioned to me about my father being murdered with an axe to his head, as William Eggleston has claimed. She's always stated that he died of smoke inhalation, and as I stated before, I suspect William Eggleston had something to do with my father's murder. The two weeks in May of 1980 when William was out of the country would have made a perfect alibi for him during the time my father was murdered. Then after my father's murder, William Eggleston made millions of dollars fabricating Tom's life and unsolved murder in his films, portrait exhibitions, and in his photography. William Eggleston could have easily had someone put a hit out on my father with some New Orleans mafia for his gain. I will always feel this way because of the way I was treated by William and his family. William had so much to gain from my father's life and unsolved murder, so this is one of the main reasons I suspect William Eggleston would have been one of the people that possibly had something to do with his murder. William also will not speak to me about my father's murder, but with him avoiding speaking to me about it only fuels my suspicion even more that William is possibly a suspect with Tom's unsolved murder. I'm going to end the episode here. I hope you are all able to clearly understand from my observation and me stating so in this podcast how my father's life and unsolved murder was slandered and fabricated through this whole perfectly boring article. 
If you did not understand, could you please comment in the comment section if you have any questions for me about my episode that you need clarity on. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and leave a comment. I'll see you next episode. Until then, goodbye everyone.